Welcome to an ADD Woman podcast. I'm your host, Lacey Estelle, writer of all things about ADHD parenting and being an ADHD mother on Mothering the Storm with Lacey Estelle at LaceyEstelle.com. Here on an ADD Woman podcast, we're going to switch it up and talk about all things to do with ADHD as an adult woman and how we deal with it. Now, you might be thinking, ADHD, women don't really have that. Actually, we do. We've all just been doing such a great job for years of masking it. So let's dive in. Hi, guys. This is Lacey Estelle with An ADD Woman Podcast. I'm super excited for the guest that I have on today. This is Marissa Lonick. Marissa is a keynote speaker, a life and business coach. She's a three times author, top rated podcast host, and the founder of Mama Work It. After spending nearly 15 years in corporate leadership positions, Marissa shifted gears to become a full-time momager and biz momager. Through her books, courses, and coaching programs, she helps busy moms juggling mom life, work life, wife life, fill in the blank life. Her time management and goal achievement strategies have helped the most overwhelmed mamas turn their dreams into reality even when they thought they had no time to make any of it happen. Thank you so much, Marissa, for coming on the show. I appreciate you immensely. Thank you for having me. I'm so excited to be here. So I originally reached out to you because you told me that you are a time management and a productivity coach. And I was like, well, that is definitely something that an ADHD woman can relate to. So can you tell me more about like what got you started and how you got into this specific niche? Yes, I would love to. So I, as you mentioned, uh, have been a working mom um, since I became a mom and a working woman for many years prior to that. And, you know, I think when you are someone who is ambitious, who's a go-getter and who's juggling lots of things, whether that be motherhood, work life, you know, uh, being in a relationship, responsibilities with your extended family, whatever those hats you wear are, time management is really, really essential. So when I first started really thinking about this particular person, this working mother who I generally support in my business, I started writing blog posts that were just super helpful tips, funny stories of what I was going through, you know, just relatable content that I thought the working mom could benefit from and also not feel so alone in that space. And the question that I'd often get over and over again, kind of the common denominator of all this was, how do you find the time? Or how do you have time to do this? Or how do you have time to do that? Because, you know, from the outside looking in, and it was true, I was juggling a lot of things, but I wasn't appearing stressed or overwhelmed. And I was doing things that brought me joy and that I, you know, I was having this, I guess, balanced life that, you know, other people wanted. And don't get me wrong, not every day is a pledge balanced here. I mean, we were all imperfect in our own ways. But anyway, that really got me thinking that, time management, productivity hacks, like this is really where the market needed more information, where the community needed more more insight, more support. So it was something I was able to do fairly easily. And so I wanted to be able to teach and help and coach other people do that too. So it started with that blog, it turned into my first book, courses, coaching programs. And now here we are, and we're in year four of Mama Work It. And that is what we do. We support women in that jungle. That's awesome. Wow. And it's so great to hear that you saw a need and that you just were like, you know what? I'm just, I I can answer this. This is something that evidently I didn't realize was kind of a gift. You know, like I've talked to people before that have skills and they're like, sometimes they have these natural skills and they're just like, I just assumed everybody had that, but not everybody does. And I definitely think, and, and I know we talked a little bit before this interview, but I am going to elaborate here. So one thing that ADHD women they really struggle with, and I'd be willing to bet some of those women that reached out to you that read your blog and were like, how do you do it? How are you juggling it all? How are you doing? And how are you doing it and, and enjoying it? I'm sure that some of those women probably also struggle with ADHD like I do. And one of the things we struggle with a lot is time blindness and also just our productivity in general, because one thing that our brains aren't very naturally inclined to do is to sequence tasks. So like, you know, for me, if I sit down and I'm like, okay, I say I'm going to write a blog post because I did, I also started writing blogs. That's how I started. I might sit down and I'd be like, well, I don't even know what I want to write about. (laughs) I gotta, I gotta figure that out too. And that just seems super overwhelming. And because my brain 
thinks of everything in the the now and the not now. It doesn't really think of like, okay, well, if I do this, this will take a couple minutes and this will take a couple minutes and this will take a couple minutes. And that's where the time blindness comes in where we we don't feel time moving. So we don't always recognize how long a task actually is going to take us. So instead we have to use certain things. So I want to ask you too, because I know you told me too that you never specifically work with neurodivergent women, but I'm sure that if, in thinking of you know, these types of scenarios, what would you say to a woman who says, you know, sometimes I just, I don't even realize how long something's going to take me or, you know, I don't know how to just get through my day and actually feel like I'm at the, like at the end of it that I actually accomplished anything. Because those are two big emotions that I think ADHD women struggle with a lot. And I think it comes back to these, these specific challenges. Yeah. Yeah. Those are great questions and definitely ones I hear a lot from, you know, general people that I work with. And I would say, first things first is, you know, we all need support sometimes in all different areas of life. Like, even though I consider myself an expert in time management and productivity, that doesn't mean that every day I'm super motivated and excited. It doesn't mean that every day I get everything done on my list that I said I was going to do. You know, there are definitely weaknesses or I wouldn't even call them weaknesses. There are just areas in my life where I would say, I know what's going to serve me better in this particular area is to either delegate this out or get a support system so that I don't have to keep it all, like keep all the mental load here for me and put all of that pressure on myself. So I think just first and foremost, recognizing that when you need support, because we all do, it's not abnormal. It's not weird. It doesn't make you any less of a person. So just recognizing what that means to you. If that is a visual cue that's going to help you with that, you know, recognition of time passing or how long you want to dedicate to a task or whatever it is. Awesome. Go on Amazon, grab yourself some visual cue that's going to be cute in your office or in your kitchen, wherever you want to keep it. And, you know, get into the habit of checking that. If it's, you know, leaning on a system, which I think everybody should utilize some sort of system when it comes to their productivity and time management, whether that be an electronic calendar, a whiteboard, a wall hanging calendar, a planner, a paper planner, like I don't have a preference because everyone's lifestyles are different, but some sort of system is essential. And you do need to lean on that in order to to move forward successfully. The second part of that, I will say that is essential here. The clarity is really key. You know, when we're sort of foggy in what our goals are, and when I say goals, I mean even small things we want to get done on a daily basis on our to-do list, not necessarily like humongous annual goals or five-year goals or things like that. So when you are foggy on what those are, it is normal for anybody in that position to not be as productive as they want to be. Why? Because they get overwhelmed. They're not sure where to start. They feel like there's too much on the list where it's easier to just kind of ignore it. You get kind of analysis paralysis. So you ignore it and you don't do anything. Or, you know, like you said with the blog post, you know, like, you know, you have to write the blog post, but you're so unsure of which direction, what your strategy is, what you even want to write about that you end up sitting there for, you know, 30, 60, 90 minutes and you type three words and you're not sure why this is so hard for you. So, you know, we have to sort of backtrack this two or three steps and we really need to prioritize the prerequisite of clarity. Clarity is so important. Having that crystal clear idea, focus, you know, list of priorities, strategy, all of those like planning essential steps are so important because they make all the other steps, like the actual elbow grease work steps, so much easier and so much quicker because we're not trying to do five different things at once, which is like that pre-planning process, the actual process, the editing process. I'm just thinking blog posts, but you know what I mean? Anything you really do. So, you know, a quote that I've heard in the past that um, a friend shared with me, which I think is so important. If you fail to plan, you plan to fail. So you have to give yourself the time and space to actually map out, plan, clarify what these goals are before you actually dive in head first to move forward and get them done. Yeah. Yeah, I definitely think that's true. And I would say in in the case of, you know, specifically for ADHD women, one thing that a lot of us don't want to admit is that we do have to actually physically create that map because a lot of times we, we wanted to just automatically be in our head. And it, it just isn't 
because of that sequencing gap where, you know, we just don't recognize that this task has to be done before this task, before this task, we have to actually start writing it down before we can kind of figure that out. I think, you know, since we're using the blog post as an example, for me, creating a blog post became a lot more efficient once I knew that, okay, I needed to choose my topic, then I needed to create an outline, and then I needed to elaborate on the outline, and then I needed to go back in and add the graphics, and then I had to share it. And it, it took me from, you know, thinking about making a blog post or something along those lines or a task in general, you know, thinking about it for like two days and procrastinating on it to like being able to just sit down and get something done in three hours. That's huge. So I also want to ask you, what would you say is one of the biggest challenges your clients face they don't realize is really cutting into their productivity? So, you know, is there any sort of like emotional, emotional baggage sometimes they're, they're carrying with them that is really cutting into their ability to just move through their tasks in a day-to-day basis? Yeah, I'm so glad that you asked this question because, you know, I, I think sometimes it's a little bit cringe when you think of like time management and productivity, like especially when I introduce myself as something, this is something I do because I think people then automatically judge me as someone who's got like tons of spreadsheets or tons of organization here and just like follows a really rigid schedule. And trust me when I say that is not my life. Like I've got four kids, nine and under running a business, like managing this house here. Like it is not that organized. Like, do I wish some days it were? Sure. But like, that's not sustainable real life here. So I will say how I like to approach time management and productivity. Of course, we're going to talk systems and hacks and things like that and organization. But we also need to talk about the internal aspect here, the mindset behind your time. Because even if you've got all your ducks in a row with the perfect planner and the perfect system and this and that, life is going to happen. Life is going to throw you the curveball and you don't want to fall apart when that happens, right? Because in my life, it happens like on a daily basis. So you have to know how to bounce back. You have to know how to approach things with the mindset of time abundance versus time scarcity. And so let's talk about that for just a quick minute, because I think that's something most people don't realize they might be harboring already. So I hear this phrase a lot from people when they first start working with me or even just when I'm out and about chatting with people, not even about time management, just about anything. I often hear people say things like, I don't have time or I didn't have time or I never have any time. And what we're doing is we have this frenemy relationship with time. We believe that she's like that flaky friend that is never around when you need her. Goes too quickly when you're having a good time. She sticks around too long when you're not having fun. And the things that you actually want to do and get done, there's never any time for. And what happens is the more we speak these words aloud, the more we believe them. And the more we believe them, the more our actions follow. So when we get invited to do something super fun outside of the normal routine, our first thought is, well, I don't have time to do that and we believe it, and we decline. Or when we think about, we get this dreamy goal of, you know, starting our business or, you know, gosh, I don't know, like DIYing our home or something like that. And then the first thought that comes is, who has time for that, right? And we believe it and we put it on the back burner and we keep giving ourselves the excuse of time getting in the way. We need to switch that more to a time abundance relationship. We need to make time more of our BFF over our frenemy. And one really simple way you can do this is when you catch yourself saying those words, I don't have time, you're going to flip the script. So you're going to stop saying, I don't have time. And you're going to start replacing that phrase with, it's not a priority to me. And magical things happen. I'm telling you when you make this simple word shift in your regular vocabulary. So let's take the example of, you know, wanting to have this dreamy goal of like starting starting a business, right? If you keep telling yourself you don't have time to start a business, you won't. If you look the script here and you say, starting a business isn't a priority to me right now, well, one of two things is going to happen. And in my opinion, they are both a win here. Okay, so on, on one hand, if you say it out loud, starting a business isn't a priority to me. You might feel like, well, you know what? It's not. 
it's not a priority to me right now. So why do I feel guilty about it? Why is this taking up precious time and energy and space when I could be focusing on other things that are indeed a priority to me right now? So I'm going to stop shitting on myself and I'm going to start living my best life. That's a win to me. On the other hand, if you're saying this out loud and it doesn't feel good, it feels almost like you're lying, right? Starting a business isn't a priority to me. Ouch, that doesn't feel aligned. That feels kind of gross. Well, what's going to happen is you're going to make it a priority. You're going to find ways to fit in little steps every day to get one step closer to that goal of starting that business. You are going to find ways to make it happen. Trust me, it's not the time, it's you. I would totally, I, I completely agree with you. And I think words are so powerful because something I, I try to always tell my mom, she struggled with yo-yo weight loss. And I, I feel like any sort of, you know, goal like that that you have, it, it really comes down to what is it that you're telling yourself about it that is keeping you from being able to achieve it. So for her, I know that some part of her tells herself that it has to be all or nothing, that if she falls off the bandwagon even just for a day, well, then she has to just fall off for four or five, two weeks, three weeks, four months, that kind of thing. And it it really isn't an all or nothing thing. You know, you really have to change your perception of just anything. When it comes to goals, when it comes to time, I would imagine that it, it's definitely a perception game rather than a actual time game. You know, it's a, it's a perception of the time that you do have. So I love your answer. I think that's so good. And I, I think it's really hard too to actually get somebody to, to say it's not a priority to me right now because we don't want to say that. <laughs> we don't want to admit that half the time. But sometimes it really isn't. And, and I think you also have to get to a point to where that can be okay. You know, I know a lot of new moms who are brand new moms and they're like, well, I want to get back into shape, but I don't have time. And I would say to them, it's not a priority to you right now, but that's okay because you have a new baby. <laughs> the priority to you right now is learning how to function now that you have this small, helpless person that's completely you know, reliant on you and your husband or, you know, your support system in general to live. And that, that takes up a lot of your headspace. And so it's okay if, you know, exercising and getting back into your size five jeans is not a priority to you right now. That's, ex you know, it's acceptable. It's normal. So yeah, the words right now. And I think that's so important to hear because we go through different seasons. We change seasons, not just, you know, every four months or whatever it is, or three months. We can change them in a week. We can change them in a year. We can change them during pregnancy or postpartum. I mean, it really is a constant evolving process. So even if right now it doesn't feel like a priority, it doesn't mean that in a week or a month or a year from now, it won't be. And that's okay. Right. Absolutely. And something I've adapted in over the last year or so is telling myself I'm in a season. But I realized that, you know, I've always kind of used it to help cope with like negative stress. But I think that it would be a good thing to actually kind of apply to, you know, positive things that I'm trying to do in my life. You know, if I were to say I'm in a season of learning how to abundantly give or something along those lines, just to kind of reiterate to myself what it is I'm really trying to work on. OK, so I want to also ask you, what do you feel like when you first began putting these things into practice now? You talked earlier that this was kind of something you were naturally already good at. But, you know, as you kind of realize, as I've learned myself, when I have to actually go teach something that I've already been practicing myself, it's it's a different process of relearning what exactly are the steps that I'm taking and, and how am I achieving this and how can I then replicate those steps for other people? So like when you looked back on the habits that you formed to help you do this, would you say that it's something that, you know, obviously you were naturally inclined to do this, but was it something that you were able to do quickly? Or was it something that when you look back, you're like, oh, I kind of remember when I was naturally applying this, you know, I didn't have to actually like get a resource from outside of myself to apply it because I just kind of knew what I needed to do. But when I was naturally applying this specific step, it was really difficult. What would you say those habits are? How long does it, does it take somebody to really get a solid foundation under them for managing their productivity and their time management? 
Well, I would say, you know, thank you for that compliment, but I don't think I've always been good at, I think I've, you know, I think, yes, I do have a natural inclination to be, you know, organized and goal oriented and things like that. But I've definitely gone through more challenging seasons than others where I needed to reassess, reevaluate, introduce some new ideas of how to get things done, change my mindset and my focus a little bit. And I feel like I'm always evolving, really. I mean, I think any transition in life, whether that be adding to your family, whether that be changing careers or jobs, whether that be moving, you know, whether that just be a new year, you know, we're coming up on the new year and that's always a, a solid time to sort of transition into some new habits and new new ways of managing things effectively. You know, it's an opportunity to kind of revamp and relook at things. So I think it's been an ever evolving process for me and it will continue to be. As far as habit formation, I'm going to share with you some things that I've learned along the way that I think are are really helpful and um, have helped me and and a lot of my clients. Number one, you know, it's scientifically proven it takes 21 days to form a new habit. So most of us, myself included, trust me, you know, we we get super motivated and excited that first few days of that new habit. And then, you know, day five, day six, day seven, day eight, we maybe fall off the bandwagon and we don't give ourselves like the grace and the slack to just get right back on and keep going. We think, oh, okay, well, that habit didn't work. Okay, on to the next idea of like quick sticks of what to do here. And that's not really giving yourself enough of a chance, right? That's not giving yourself enough of a length of time, um, of, of enough of an opportunity to really take that on. The other mistake a lot of people make when it comes to habits is they try to take on too much too quickly. So they think, okay, January 1st, here are all the things I want to do or like Monday or the start of the month or whatever it is. And you pack on all these goals and there's nothing wrong with being super ambitious. I'm a very ambitious person, but we have to understand that too much too quickly is not sustainable. It's like, it's like crash dieting, right? It's like you try and go from being like, a regular person who's maybe, you know, having lattes every day and maybe eating gluten and meat and all these, you know, like normal things people eat and then going to become like a vegan the next day without caffeine, like that's really challenging. Your body's going to withdraw. Like it's going to be too much change too quick, right? Not to say you can't get there, but smaller steps are probably more sustainable along the way. So I love to tell people to start with one tiny habit. And I got the tiny habit uh, expression and idea from a habit expert out there. His name is BJ Fogg. He's a professor at Stanford. He wrote a book, Tiny Habits. Uh, he's got a TED Talk. Totally check him out. And he talks about introducing a tiny, tiny habit into your day. And then you will notice that as you get consistent about this habit, you will naturally push yourself to do more and do more and do more. And his funny example that he sort of did on himself, his experiment was he wanted to get fit. And so, you know, he didn't tell himself tomorrow I'm hitting the gym an hour a day every day. He gave himself a tiny habit. And the tiny habit was he tacked it on to something he was already doing, by the way. This is also part of the tiny habit process. He said, every time I use the bathroom, I'm going to get down on the ground and I'm going to do two push-ups. That was his tiny habit. Okay. So you can imagine, you know, from the get-go, he was probably doing 10, 10-ish push-ups a day, right? Depending how much water he drank. And then as time went on, he was, the two push-ups got super easy. And he was like, I'm going to challenge myself. I'm going to do three. I'm going to do four. I'm going to do five. I'm going to do 10. So six months, a year later, I'm not sure how, how long the time frame was, but BJ got ripped, you know? And it all started with this tiny tiny habit of two push-ups after using the bathroom, something he was already doing multiple times per day. So if you can think about even just introducing one tiny habit, this can have massive impact into just regular things you're doing without even having to motivate or hype yourself up or even, you know, push yourself to get to that 21 day limit. Yeah. Yeah. I would definitely say that learning to take things in smaller increments, you know, um, one thing that, you know, I learned to apply the 12 steps to my life when I was, um, going through my divorce and, uh, they teach you one day at a time. And I found that any habit, 
like anything that you're trying to do, if you if you really drill it into your mind that you're just going to do it just for one day, it becomes really easy. Not really, I say easy, but it's not exactly easy, but it does become to where you're like, well, I just have to get through today. And instead of thinking to yourself, well, I got to get through three more weeks or I got to get through two more weeks or I got to get through, you know, two more months because you'll overwhelm yourself thinking about how far you still have to go. And instead, you just take it that one moment at a time. So I, I think that actually that that author that you mentioned, I think he was an inspiring author to uh, the author I read on Atomic Habits, James Clear. Oh, okay. Yep, mm-hmm. I think that he talked about him too. And that he, he even said, he said, a lot of the stuff that I'm putting into the, my book, you can also find in the books that he's written. It's such a funny thing too. Like, can you imagine being in a public bathroom and running into a guy who's just like randomly doing push-ups and he, he took a whiz? I don't know. That's, that's so funny for me to think about. But I know what you mean because I know for me, I I cold turkeyed. I did a uh, the JJ Virgin diet, which is really similar to the Whole30 diet. So I cut out gluten, corn, soy, sugar, I don't know, a few other things for three weeks. And the only thing that got me through was I just told myself no for a day. And like, that's what it would be. Like, that's what I kept telling myself. I was like, if I just tell myself no today, I can get, I can get to tomorrow morning. And then I just have to tell myself no again. And eventually... By doing those things, you build momentum into these small habits that you have and you and you build that momentum that you need to continue pushing you towards that goal. And I'm I really gotta go read that whole story now because I'm really curious how the two push-ups after using the bathroom turned into like being super ripped, because it makes me want to think about doing two push-ups after I go to the bathroom. <laughs> so one of the things I, I do want to ask you about too, um, and that is that. You know, a lot of ADHD women, and I know I personally struggle with this. I literally just had this conversation with my husband. We attribute our productivity to our self-worth. Is this something that you've encountered with some of the women that you're dealing with? Because I also feel like sometimes that trips me up. Because, for instance, me and my husband had it the other day because after I, like, really worked through some emotions I was having one day, I was like, I think that I was mad at myself for what I didn't get done that day. And so I assumed my husband would be mad at me too. He wasn't, but it it came back to, in my mind, I was feeling like inadequate or just like I was failing him because I hadn't done X, Y, Z. I had done A, B, C, but I hadn't done X, Y, Z. And so when, you know, when he got home, I immediately was like, he's going to, you know, he's going to be mad. And I think in my mind, I didn't, um, recognize that that's what that's what was happening but sometimes because of that I also notice like I'll struggle to to want to be productive in the ways that I want to be productive because I worry that you know it's not going to look like enough to somebody somebody else so is this something that you've encountered in like your communities or with your clients that you know you've helped them kind of to work through and learn that like productivity and like you said a major part of being productive is being flexible, which is something that I think most of us don't recognize that it takes being flexible to continue to be productive because things happen. But in helping them to, I guess, kind of like bridge that gap and and uh, not relate so much to that so that when they have a day and they have to be super flexible, they're not like, uh, I'm worthless. Yeah, no, completely. I think Many of my clients have experienced this. I know I've experienced this. And I even developed a quiz in my programs that is like, how worthy am I? Uh, Because I think a lot of women in particular, especially moms, you know, we struggle with the worthiness factor in asking for support and receiving support. We think we have to do it all. We think we have to juggle it all. We think we have to, you know, hit all of these societal standards. We think the highlight reels are real. They're not. And, you know, I think worthiness is a big factor there, right? It's it's what will often affect our ability to confidently ask for and receive support. So I think it manifests and shows up in many different ways. Uh, the thing that I want to stress here is the expectations we're setting on ourselves. So 
most people out there are setting unreasonable expectations, right? They are putting together massive to-do lists. They are, you know, saying yes to too many things. They are, you know, they're thinking they have to live up to those societal standards. And then at the end of the day, even if they've done nine out of 10 things, all they can focus on is the one thing they didn't get done. Yeah. And by the way, nine things is a lot of things like I don't recommend it. So what I like to say is we need to really get to a place where our expectations are more reasonable. They're more reasonable so that we can sort of practically and and practically saying like we can give ourselves that quote permission to be done and not feel like there's always more to do, even though there may always be more to do. But for that day, these are the things that I expected and set out for myself to do. So there's like accountability there, but there's also, you know, the ability to like shut it down, right? And not let guilt creep in and and make us want to be like energizer bunnies all day long. Because rest is equally as important and productive as work. So yeah, I like to tell people, get yourself, set yourself three small goals a day. Doesn't matter like what they're related to, like They can be, you know, all related to work. They can be a combination of things. I personally would encourage you to make sure at least one of those things is something for yourself, you know, whether that be exercise, whether that be a meditation or, you know, fill in the blank, whatever it is, right? But three small goals a day that you will absolutely hold yourself accountable for, like you will get done. So you will feel productive, but you also after that can give yourself permission to be done. Even though you may have other things on the back burner. And hey, some days you will feel motivated and like an overachiever and you may tackle more and other days you may not. And you are allowed to be done after those three things. You're allowed to be done with zero things some days. But if you want sort of some sort of organizational tip, that's what I'm going to tell you. I think that that's so important. And I think I really like where you said giving yourself permission to be done because it's something I was just, I, I'm, I'm in a season of learning this, of learning that no, for me, you know, and I, I think I talked to you before, but um, I'm a Christian. So I've been trying really hard to, you know, recognize that my self-worth is in my my faith, my beliefs um, in God and not in what I do, what I don't do. And it's it's really, it's really hard. It's really hard to apply those things because I feel like it's been ingrained in me. And I know that the ADHD women that I, you know, I hear from, that listen, you know, they've also had, um, their whole life has been one, um, like point of success to another equal to their, I say worthiness, but not even necessarily worthiness, their value, I guess. Um, because like we struggle a lot of times I struggled through school massively. I struggled through, I, I didn't really get finished in college because I was struggling so much. And it was one of those things where because I couldn't do it, or at least because my brain was not working in a way that would allow me to function well enough, I immediately was like, I'm just, I'm just lazy. I'm just, you know, there's, it it must be a character flaw. And so, you know, for you to say, give yourself permission to, to be done, that's huge. Like I talked to a friend and I've been like, I have an issue with resolution. They don't like when things don't feel resolved or they don't feel completed or they don't feel done. And she's like, yeah, that's not realistic. And I'm like, I think I'm realizing that now because for a long time, I, it was something I always needed. I I needed, I needed things to be complete. I needed everything to come full circle. I needed all of that. And then sometimes that just doesn't happen, especially does it happen if you're a work from home mom, especially does it happen if you're a mom in general, Um, especially doesn't happen if you are you know, running a business, there are days where you're going to walk away and there's a t- laundry list of tasks that still need to get done. And you have to say, yeah, I need my rest now. Otherwise I can't, I can't complete it tomorrow. Um, in, in giving yourself permission to do that, it is huge. And I think that that is really important. I hope that the women that listen to this podcast take that away because that's something I'm learning to do myself. And it's hard because I'll sit in my living room. My husband gets home from work and I'm like, I know that I gave myself permission to sit down finally, but is he going to give me permission? Which he doesn't, he's not even like, he doesn't even care. I'm just like in my head, like, 
can I, can I just be okay? Is it okay for me to just sit down and just be watching a movie or you know, anything along those lines? So I love that. I also wanted to, you did mention um, that you have uh, some free resources that are available to my audience. Can you tell me more about them? Yes, I would love to. So I have a few things that I think would be super beneficial depending on your audience's needs. One is the time management free mini course. So this is a total of um, six mini videos. I think they're about 30-ish minutes long, maybe a little bit less, uh, over six days, and really just some incredible takeaways on my time management philosophy. My time management philosophy is all about really prioritizing yourself into your life so that you can live your best life. And I think while this is obviously very, very relevant for moms, I think it's very relevant for women in general. Women yes. tend to be more caretakers, nurturers. We're doing lots of things for lots of other people and often putting ourselves at the bottom of the to-do list. And we all know what happens to the things at the bottom of the to-do list. They rarely they don't get, get done. done. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, so those are a lot of my philosophies and how I teach time management here because I want time management and wellness to go hand in hand. Because to me, that is the ultimate recipe for productivity, for motivation, for energy, for living your best life. So that is available um, via the link that I'm sure you'll have in the show notes. And then also we've got uh, productivity hacks for mompreneurs. So if you are a mom in business uh, and you are juggling motherhood alongside running a business, being an entrepreneur, got some great hacks there that you can download too. Awesome. Awesome. And then um, you also have a uh, paid coaching program that if it's something that they're interested in doing, they can also join that. And I will link to that as well. I, I want to thank you again, Marissa, for for coming on. I appreciate you so much. And I think that anybody listening to this podcast is going to take away so many really good nuggets of information. <laughs> so I appreciate you and thank you again. And um, I'll be talking to you, everybody really soon. Thanks for having me. And I am so honored to have been a guest on your show. Thank you. You're welcome. That is going to wrap up this episode of an ADD Woman podcast. And if any of the things I just said are of interest to you, love to hear what you think. And I'll be talking to you guys soon.